My name is Ted Clement, Executive Director of Save Mount Diablo, and welcome to our Nature Heals and Inspires Zoom series. For those who might be new to Save Mount Diablo, we are a nationally accredited nonprofit land trust formed in 1971 in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have a mission to protect the important open space lands associated with Mount Diablo and the mountain's connection to its sustaining Diablo range. To create lasting public benefits for our communities and local flora and fauna, we use various tools like land acquisition, advocacy, education, and land stewardship. To our supporters watching this, thank you. Together with your wonderful support, Save Mount Diablo is able to do great things to protect the ultimate foundation for our long-term health and well-being, nature. Understanding that nature is the ultimate foundation, we developed a free public education Zoom series entitled Nature Heals and Inspires to help our communities understand that nature is a critical part of the solution to working through these challenging times. Our Nature Heals and Inspires Zoom series started in April 2020, and to date we have delivered over 25 presentations by an amazing and diverse group of experts, ecotherapists, conservationists, scholars, artists, scientists, etc. All exploring this topic of how nature helps heal and inspire us. And through this exploration, we have been getting important clues on how to better align ourselves and our culture with the natural world we are part of. Mount Diablo State Park has been helping heal and inspire our communities for 100 years. And of course, the mountain itself has been helping inspire and heal people since time immemorial. And this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., the Mount Diablo State Park Centennial Celebration event will be held at the CSU A Concord campus off Ignacio Valley Road. Save Mount Diablo and our friends and partners at California State Parks, the Mount Diablo Interpretive Association and CSU East Bay are coming together to put on this event. So we hope you'll join us. Later this year on December 7th, Save Mount Diablo turns 50 and we will celebrate our 50th anniversary over the course of a year with a big event for it next year. We have partnered with Mount Diablo State Park throughout our entire history, and we have proudly helped Mount Diablo State Park grow from under 7,000 acres when Save Mount Diablo was formed in 1971 to over 20,000 acres today. And there remains good growing to do, which is very encouraging. With this year marking the 100th anniversary of Mount Diablo State Park, Save Mount Diablo and the Mount Diablo Interpretive Association helped sponsor a Joan Hamilton film about this wonderful state park we all love. You will see that film shortly, a natural fit for our Nature Heals and Inspires series. But first you will hear from Steve Smith of the Mount Diablo Interpretive Association and then Joan Hamilton. After the film, there will be a roundtable discussion and Q&A with various people who worked on the film. And I wanna thank all those very special people. And I wanna thank the Mount Diablo Interpretive Association, California State Parks, and Joan Hamilton for this incredible film. And I hope you all really enjoy it. Steve, take it away. Oh, thanks, Ted. Thanks so much, everyone, for attending tonight. We've got about 170 people here tonight, so a good showing. Um, I'm glad you could join us. Uh, as Ted mentioned, I'm president of MDIA, the Mount Diablo Interpretive Association, and we are a nonprofit cooperative association that works directly with California State Parks and specifically Mount Diablo State Park uh, to help administer it and interpret the mountain. Uh, we're responsible for selling all the merchandise on the mountain, which is our main fundraiser, and and uh, we've created a lot of great Centennial merchandise, some of which I'm showing off for you. Um, and that can be found at our visitor centers, as well as at our online portal at mdia.org. Speaking of our website, we're very proud of it. It has a host of information, a wealth of articles on the history, the nature, the cultural history of the mountain, as well as uh, all the information about upcoming events. We sponsor a lot of hikes and our own webinar series on various topics. It's also a great place to find out more about the mountain, how to get there, how to park, uh, what the fire weather is like, 
And you can also use our website to check the weather at the summit, as well as uh, purple air for uh, smoke, uh, for those of you who are using the mountain. Uh, as Ted mentioned, we are having our centennial celebration on Saturday. It's been a long year of planning and we're really hoping it goes off without a hitch. It's supposed to be a beautiful day. And so we're counting on you to come out and help us celebrate. From 10 to four, we'll have food trucks, some music, some speakers. We'll have our film that we're debuting tonight uh, on a loop uh, that you can enjoy in the theater. And we have over 25 exhibitors uh, representing, we'll have live animals, like bats, reptiles, snakes, spiders, uh, peregrine falcon, uh, possibly an eagle. And we'll also have other groups represented uh, like Save Mount Diablo, MDIA, uh, astronomers, geologists, and so many more. So it should be a great day. So come on out and celebrate with us. Uh, grab some food, enjoy some music, and uh, party it up for the 100th. And looking forward to the next 100 years, MDIA is proud to launch a, a new endeavor to build a new visitor center at Mitchell Canyon in Clayton. And so stop by our booth and learn more about that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it back to Ted. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. And again, we're so grateful for our partnership with the Mount Diablo Interpretive Association. Uh, Joan, let's turn it over to the producer of this great film. Joan, take it away. Joan, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, this, Steve, that celebration on Saturday sounds so great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to be there for sure. And thanks to you uh, at MDIA, thanks to Save Mount Diablo because whether you realized it at first or not, you've been supporting Audible Mount Diablo, this video series since 2007. And at that point, um, Seth Adams, Ken Lavin, and Scott Hine started working with me to make films about Mount Diablo and uh, some places farther away. Some of them were films about the most popular places like Rock City and Mitchell Canyon, the Falls Trail, uh, the Mary Bowerman Loop. Others were places farther afield like Los Vaqueros Watershed, Morgan Territory, Black Diamond Mines. And some of them are about uh, topics like plants or geology. That's one of Ken Lavin's specialties. Um, and wildlife, uh, including peregrine falcons. Um, the film you're about to see was initiated by the man you just heard from, Steve Smith. He, um, he's a very patient man. He, I think he has watched all 20 of those films, if not all of them, most of them. And um, he came to me a while back and said he thought we could mine our archives and go to Ken a few more times and get a couple more good interviews from Ken because he's the font of all history wisdom. Get some Scott Hind photos in there and also utilize um, the video of a fairly new photographer named Kendall Uy, who um, has provided some wonderful inspiring videos for this film. I think it's fair to say that for all of us who've worked on this film, and by now there are dozens of people who've helped, and I thank them all, um, Mount Diablo and the lands around it are one of the best things about the Bay Area for us. And I hope that the film will help explain why. So from there, let's watch the film. Mount Diablo State Park was established in 1921, but the mountain has been important to humans for thousands of years. We're taught that there was a time of a great flood, when everything in the world was covered with water, except for the two peaks of the mountain that's right behind us, Tuushtak. When the waters receded, our Creator created the world as we know it today, but we're taught that we're supposed to tend to this, take care of it, steward it. This is our most sacred peak. 
Starting in the late 1700s, the Spanish and later Mexicans and Americans brutally forced native peoples off the lands around Mount Diablo and elsewhere. Disease and persecution almost wiped them out, along with their languages, religion, and culture of caring for the land. But some managed to survive, and their descendants still revere the mountain today. The first Overland immigrant party headed to Mount Diablo, they were, they were using newspaper accounts from Dr. John Marsh, the first American settler in Contra Costa County. In those accounts that he'd send back to, to newspapers in the East and the Midwest, he would describe how to get to the Bay Area across the Sierra. Well, well, this was ironic because Dr. John Marsh had never crossed the Sierra. In fact, no one but a few fur trappers and, and Native Americans had. The thing he got completely right was, when you get across the Sierra, look for the double pyramid peak off in the west, and my ranch will be found at the base of Mount Diablo. So it was important in terms of guiding people. You can still see it from half of California which is why it was chosen as the initial point for California's first baseline and meridian. If you own property in most of northern and central California, your property lines are based on those initial north-south meridian and east-west baselines from the peak of Mount Diablo. Mount Diablo is located right at this point between the Bay Area and the Central Valley between the coast and the delta. As the mountain rose and things disappeared from the area around it, it retained things that you normally associate with wetter Pacific Northwest climates to the north, then it retained things that you normally associate with the Mojave Desert to the south. And it's the northernmost location for coulter pines, which are generally found 200 miles south in Southern California. But it's also a, a center of endemism. You have plants that have evolved into new forms as they survived on Mount Diablo. The Mount Diablo Fairy Lantern is the most obvious example. So Mount Diablo is just an amazingly rich place. It's a reservoir of biodiversity and it's an incredibly interesting place as a result too. In the late 1700s, when the Spanish came north along the coast, they brought food with them in the shape of cattle. That was the beginning of a slow but revolutionary change in the mountain's ecology. The change was not only caused by what the cattle ate, but also by the non-native grass seeds the cattle brought in on their hides. As more colonists flooded into California, more foreign seeds came in too, in the ballast of ships and in loads of grain. By the middle of the 20th century, in many places, bunch grasses had been replaced by non-native annual grasses with much shorter roots. And the big change was to the hydrology of the mountain. The native bunch grasses allowed the water to be released slowly into the creeks and streams, so they ran late into the year. But with the annual non-natives, the runoff was great. Every time it rained, down came the water into the creeks carrying mud and sediment. So that had a very negative impact on the aquatic life on Mount Diablo. The cattle have been gone since the late 1990s with the change in park policy. That's brought in some new problems. There was a fear that our ground squirrel population would evacuate the park. Ground squirrels like grazed grass so they can see predators and ground squirrels are a keystone species. Raptors depend on them for food and the mammal carnivores depend on them. And also animals lower on the food web. They use ground squirrel burrows in the summer as refuge. The jury is still out on that. In some areas, ground squirrels are still common. In others, they have completely disappeared, but we don't know why. Naturalist Michael Marciano worked on one of Mount Diablo's cattle ranches in the early 1970s. It's not a working operation today, but you can still see its buildings as you drive up Northgate Road. Marciano recalls asking the ranch's owner, Angel Curley, if she might want to cut down some oaks to make more land for grazing. She looked at me, she says, Michael, she says, let me explain something to you. I am very fortunate 
to be able to own a place like this and to have all this land here. She said, I love it. It's important for me to protect it. And I'll never forget that state of mind that you have to be stewards of these lands. And even a person that might have occasionally poisoned ground squirrels around certain areas or would have maybe shot a coyote if it felt it was destroying one of their cattle, that type of a person still believed in protecting it. In the 1870s, a mountain guide and developer named Joseph C.V. Hall came out west. He was famous for his work on Mount Washington in New Hampshire. But now his sights were set on Mount Diablo, which he said had more rare attractions to the lover of nature and fine mountain scenery than any mountain of the same altitude, perhaps in the world. By the spring of 1874, Hall and his business partners had built two toll roads up the mountain, one from the north, the other from the south. The newly accessible mountain was a big hit. Some 800 people paid the 25-cent toll in the first month. Hall added an observatory with a telescope at the top and constructed a 16-room hotel, originally called Toll House, later called Mountain House, two miles below it. A man named Seeley Bennett started taking people up to Mountain House in an open stage. It was very popular. People would come there not only to stay overnight and, and see Mount Diablo, they came up for weddings and for christenings, and they got water from a nearby spring, delicious fresh water. And the story goes that spring disappeared with the San Francisco earthquake in April 1906. Mount Diablo's and ranchers were never really comfortable with people traveling through their grazing land to get to this hotel. They blamed them for scaring the cattle and, and starting fires. So they took this opportunity to petition the Contra Costa Board of Supervisors to close the roads in 1895. And after that, well, you could still get there, but you had to walk up. And the only people intrepid enough to walk up were graduate students from UC Berkeley who made the trek every year. In 1901, the mountain house mysteriously burned. The ranchers were always suspected of having precipitated the fire, but nothing could ever be proved. The one mysterious thing when they went to visit the smoldering ruins of the mountain house was the doors and the windows were found in a creek bed. And that remained a mystery for several decades until finally one of the ranch hands on his deathbed fessed up. He said, yes, we indeed had burned down the mountain house. And the rancher told us before we set it afire to take off the doors and the windows, because if we later got caught, we couldn't be prosecuted for arson on a dwelling, because without doors and windows, it wasn't a dwelling. A little more than a decade later, tourism rose again, and this time it was a motorized revival led by developer Robert Noble Burgess. Robert Noble Burgess' big idea was to build homes all the way to the top of Mount Diablo. Diablo Estates, they were to be called. And he built Northgate Road and Southgate Road to access the summit. He was so proud of his roads that he advertised them as being suitable for auto racing. He wanted to preserve Rock City, the mountain's most famous picnic area today. But he didn't like the name. He gave it a new name. He called it Garden of the Jungle Gods. And he gave names to many of the rocks that persist today. Elephant Rock and Whale Rock and Butterfly Rock. But the crown gem of this project was to be a castle on top of Mount Diablo called Torre del Sol, which was to be remarkably similar to what was later to become Hearst Castle. And there was a good reason for that. William Randolph Hearst was his financial backer for this project. But neither the homes nor the castle were ever built. America got into World War I and William Randolph Hearst became interested in that. Burgess's dream of uh, Mount Diablo estates went bust during World War I. He went bankrupt, and Walter Frick acquired his property. But it was about this time that citizens and local community officials and politicians got together and began to agitate to start Mount Diablo State Park. And a bill was passed in the state legislature authorizing the creation of a park and even allocating a little bit of money. So on June 19th, 1921, everybody who was anybody 
showed up for the dedication. By the end of the 1920s, the legislature had passed a revenue bond to establish a California state park system. And then there was money to expand Mount Diablo from a few hundred acres to a few thousand acres. And again, that called for a ceremony this time in April 1931 in Rock City. And this being the second year of the Great Depression, everybody decided they wanted to be at that big dedication. Even the governor of California, Sonny Jim Rolfe, decided he would come along. So on the morning of April 26th, 1931, people started to assemble at Rock City. Three high school bands were bussed up and began playing. A contingent of rodeo riders from Livermore made their way up and they were entertaining the assembled masses with their lariat tricks. A PA system was set up in eager anticipation of the dignitaries that would soon be motoring their way up the top. Early in the morning of Martinez, 600 cars assembled, led by Sonny Jim Rolfe. But by the time they had got from Martinez to Pacheco, it had actually started to sprinkle. By the time they got to Concord, it was raining, unmistakably. By the time they got to Walnut Creek, it was coming down cats and dogs. By the time they got to the bottom of Mount Diablo's scenic highway, it was coming down coyotes and bobcats. It was some serious business. And at just at that time, Mount Diablo let loose with some great thunder. Sonny Jim Rolfe, who had been drinking, woke up with a start. He knew the National Guard and was up at Rock City, going to give him a 21-gun salute. He thought that they had started without him. One of the folks in an adjoining car noted Sonny Jim was already drunk as a skunk. This wasn't going to be pleasant. So it was decided that rather than try to make their way up, they would retire to the grounds of the Diablo Country Club. And that's where they had their little ceremony. Well, the poor folks that were assembled up at Rock City, they had no choice. They had to wait out the deluge. Some of the cars up there had become mired in the mud, and that was a problem. They tried to push them out with man and woman power. That didn't work. All looked lost. And that's where the rodeo riders from Livermore came in handy. They lassoed the cars with their ropes, and they were able to pull them out to safety. And they made their way down. Anyway, it was all too much for the poor park warden. He had just started, and the next day he checked himself into Martinez Hospital in a state of near collapse. One of the participants up at Rock City said, well, all I can say is today Mount Diablo sure lived up to its name. And that was the story of the second dedication of Mount Diablo State Park. park thrived in the years that followed, greatly benefiting from one of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal programs, the Civilian Conservation Corps. The CCC, as it was known, provided jobs to help families recovering from the Great Depression. Some three million men participated, and about a thousand of them were stationed at Mount Diablo from 1934 to 1941. They built the visitor center on the summit, as well as roads, culverts, retaining walls, water supply systems, camping and picnic sites, and trails. The CCC also built the first stone barbecues at Live Oak Campground. Their design proved so popular that it was used in other state and even national parks. Around the same time the CCC was building park amenities, Mary Bowerman was cataloging its plants. She was one of botanist Willis Lynn Jepson's graduate students at the University of California at Berkeley. Bowerman said she was chosen to study Mount Diablo because she was the only botany student with a car. Well, she definitely proved herself up to the task. In 1944, she published The Flowering Plants and Ferns of Mount Diablo, a book that's still the Bible for botanists today. In the 1970s, she helped found both the Mount Diablo Interpretive Association, which fosters appreciation and enlightened use of the state park, and Save Mount Diablo, which has dramatically expanded protected land on and around the mountain. 
Bowerman began her Diablo research right after fires swept across 25,000 acres on the mountain in 1931. Mary was an absolute expert in fire uh, recovery because she had the years to watch it. And there were fires, huge fires, in the 30s and 40s and 70s on Mount Diablo. After a fire in 1977, Dean Lesher of the Contra Costa Times raised money to replant the blackened slopes with Monterey pines. But Monterey pines don't grow on Mount Diablo. They're a non-native species and would have been unlikely to survive. Mary was outraged. So she really tried to get professors there to talk about that it will restore itself. Yes, you need to deal with erosion and clear the creeks, but it will restore itself. Eventually, Bowerman and Mount Diablo State Park used the money the newspaper had raised to build the Mary Bowerman Trail around the top of the mountain. Today, it's one of the park's most popular hikes. In less than a mile, it passes through forest, grassland, and chaparral habitats, with wide-angle views of northern and central California. The first two-tenths of a mile is wheelchair-accessible. Through her work with Save Mount Diablo, Mary was directly involved in saving places on the mountain that many of us take for granted today. North Peak, Mitchell, Back, and Donner Canyons, Black Hawk Ridge, the Black Hills, and Sycamore Canyon, Pine Canyon and Castle Rock, White Canyon and Riggs Canyon. She never got a job at a university as a botanist, but in her mid-60s, she created a, a conservation organization which would expand on her legacy in a way that affects the entire state of California and the Bay Area. You just have to give her incredible credit for starting something that's made such a huge difference to so many people. When Walter Frick owned the western side of the mountain, he approved the building of a beacon on top, the standard Diablo Tower. In the late 1920s, there was a move to popularize commercial aviation. But the problem was there was no radar back then. And to be profitable, planes had to fly at night, which was very difficult navigation. So the idea was hit upon to establish a series of beacons lighthouses for aircraft. So on top of Mount Diablo, a 75-foot steel tower was built. And atop that tower was mounted a 10 million candle power beacon. And on the tower, giant letters SD were mounted. That stood for Standard Diablo. The Standard Oil Company was one of the financial contributors. I think the angle for them was they would be able to sell more aircraft fuel. But anyway, they needed a big celebrity to turn the light on, and the biggest one around at the time was Charles Lindbergh. And he sent a telegraph message to turn the light on. In April 1928, the beacon went on, and the light remained on for the next decade, braving brush fires and thunderstorms, until it was moved to the top of the new museum. 1939 as the museum neared completion. But then on December 7th, 1941, the park warden raced up to turn off the light because Pearl Harbor had just been bombed. And he was instructed to get that light off lest the Japanese Imperial Navy use the beacon on Mount Diablo to launch an invasion of the West Coast. After the war, well, there was radar and you didn't need the, the light anymore. So it remained off until 1964, when it was decided that turning the light on once a year on December 7th would be a great tribute to the Pearl Harbor survivors. On December 7th, 1964, retired Rear Admiral Chester Nimitz made the windy ride up to the top of Mount Diablo, and he lit the light for that first time. Then every year after that, on December 7th, the light is turned on. Having served as Commander-in-Chief of Allied Forces in the Pacific during World War II, Nimitz was perfect for the job. 
The light was also turned on in 2020 and 2021, when Save Mount Diablo lit it every Sunday night to honor the COVID-19 pandemic heroes and bring light into a dark time. Mount Diablo is the northern sentinel, the northern anchor of the Diablo Range, part of the inner coast mountain range of California. It's also the backdrop to our everyday lives. Sometimes we're lucky enough to be there physically and sometimes just in our minds. The park has grown from 631 acres in 1921 to over 20,000 acres today. That's 20 times the size of Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. State Park Supervising Ranger Cameron Morrison has worked here for more than 20 years, welcoming countless visitors and roaming the mountain's rugged terrain from Mitchell Canyon Visitor Center at the base of the mountain to the 3,849-foot summit. You've got some of the best views in California from Mount Diablo State Park. The highest elevation in Contra Costa County is found at the summit. We have over 160 miles of fire roads and trails. We have right around a half a million people per year that visit Mount Diablo State Park. And many of those people are coming to the park to hike, to photograph, to enjoy the plants and wildlife. We have people that come here for recreation, riding their bicycles, trail running, camping. The park has three campgrounds with 63 sites, as well as five group campsites. There are some rules, of course. Stay on established trails, ride bicycles only on paved roads, fire roads, and other designated trails. Don't bring a dog, unless you'll be restricting your visit to a campground or other developed areas. With the rest of California, Mount Diablo also has been impacted by climate change and droughts. Due to the drought over the last two years, our water reserves are extremely low. In 2021, some of the springs the park depends on for water were drying up. In some places, trees were dying. Animals were stressed. But Mount Diablo State Park's size and diverse terrain, as well as a network of more than 100,000 acres of protected lands around it, act as a kind of insurance against the worst effects of climate change. They give plants and animals, including humans, room to roam. Mount Diablo's changed a lot over time, but in a lot of ways, it's remained the same. The tule oak no longer grazed the hillsides. The rainbow trout are gone from the creeks and the, the grizzly bears are gone from the canyons. But the golden eagles are here in great numbers and the peregrine falcons are here. Even the badgers are coming back. You never know what you're going to see on any given day. You might go out looking for a particular bird or plant and you come around a, a bend in the trail and there's a, a beautiful flower or a shrub in bloom or one of Mount Diablo's panoply of eight-legged, six-legged, four-legged or even no-legged critters there sharing your space. Here we are in the midst of a, a busy urban area and it's just a place where you can go to get lost, figuratively, not literally, from the everyday world and to be amongst the flora and fauna of nature. Well, that was great, jo Joan, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Thanks for suggesting it, making it happen. I would like to mention uh, before we move on that uh, we've had a video that plays up at the summit uh, for the last 20 years. It's, it's uh, a little beyond its age, it's tired and uh, 
outdated. And uh, when we put this film together uh, with Joan with the Centennial in mind, it, it occurred to me that what a wonderful video it would make to play on a loop at the summit for all visitors to see. And uh, many people do come in to the visitor center from all over the world. And they sit down in that uh, video room and learn about Mount Diablo. And so the park is going to show this video as their new video. And so uh, hundreds of thousands of people will have the opportunity to see it throughout the years. So uh, once COVID uh, lets up and we're able to, to use our media room again, it will be shown. So uh, it's wonderful for all involved who um, made such a wonderful video and, and a wonderful tribute to our great mountain. Great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Karen Ferrier from Save Mount Diablo, and I'm going to help facilitate some of the questions for the panelists. So um, have all the panelists been introduced? I know Scott has been quiet here, but we all, Scott Hine and, and Kendall. Um, I don't think um, Ken has been introduced. Oh, okay. And I Kendall. saw him in the video, so, you know. Ken, Ken and Kendall, I think, have not been yes. introduced. Yes. Um, Seth is good at introducing people. Seth, do you mind? Not to mention Seth. <laughs> Seth can introduce himself, but I feel like he's just known all around the world. But um, mm -hmm. Seth can introduce himself and uh, Kendall and Ken and Scott. And then I'll get the questions together right here. Yeah, actually, I'm going to start by um, just thanking Joan for putting together such an amazing film with lots of collaborators and, and um, lots of work over the years uh, to create the materials that, that contributed to it. Uh, I hope everyone thought it was as excellent as I do. Um, <clears throat> Ted Clement is Save Mount Diablo's executive director. Um, Ken Lavin uh, is the most knowledgeable person about Mount Diablo and Mount Diablo State Park uh, anywhere. Um, Joan is starting to vie with him because she's done so much research about the mountain. <laughs> no, um, no. Steve Smith is the uh, president of the Mount Diablo Interpretive Association. Scott Heim is a former president of Save Mount Diablo who's done incredible photographs uh, over the years of Mount Diablo and the surrounding area. Um, I'm the land conservation director for Save Mount Diablo. And Kendall Uwe, um is someone who probably hikes more than anybody else on the mountain while taking incredible photographs and video uh, that were all throughout the, all throughout the film. So uh, uh, Karen is Save Mount Diablo's uh, development director and Joanne is running the show here for all of us. But uh, uh, what a great uh, 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 product there, Joan. I'm so happy to have been able to be here for the premiere. Um, and I think Karen's gonna start with the questions. That was exceptionally well done. I'm very, everyone is very modest here. So um, I know none of you like to claim your successes, but we're beyond thrilled at your support. Um, okay, here's one. Have the invasive annual grasses been replaced with native bunch grasses? And if so, would that change the effects of the drought relative to water? Not sure who wants to take that one. That's a good one for Ken. All right, Bing, Ken, what do you think? Well, it's very difficult to restore the, the native bunch grasses once the annuals have taken over. The uh, non-native annuals put out a lot of seed and they just have a great competitive advantage. So where you do find the, still find the native grasses is, uh, one place is in the serpentine soil on Mount Diablo, which has lots of, which the uh, non-natives have a great difficulty growing in. Serpentines are state rock and it's full of iron and magnesium and nickel and chromium and our native plants have learned to live with it, but not so the non-natives. So that is one of the great bastions uh, of native plants on Mount Diablo. I, I think the figure is one uh, half of 1% of California's serpentine soil but 10% of the endemic species in California grow on serpentine. But uh, that's a very long sideways answer, but it would help, but it's just too difficult to get the, the, um, the native bunch grasses back once the, once, the, uh, perenni once the annuals have taken control. And do you think it uh, is true that because of the deep root system of the native bunch grasses that Maybe our golden hills weren't always golden, uh, that perhaps this time of year they would be uh, a little greener. 
Well, I know one thing, it would be easier to walk up a hillside with the gaps <laughs> between the bunch grasses and not get seeds all over us. <laughs> Generally, if you look at the, the bunch grasses with the deep roots, you're right, Steve, you notice right in the middle, they're still green, even, even at the, in the height of summer. So it certainly would be a different experience and probably a lot more pleasant. The thing I would add about the bunch grasses that's kind of great is um, you can be on a property that grazes to the ground, to the dirt, um, and you shift the grazing pressure, lessen the number of cattle. We do this on our properties all the time. Um, and the next year, old growth bunch grasses that have been there hiding for a hundred years, um, their root systems, uh, will generate uh, big new bunch grasses in the first or the second year. So they're still hanging out there in lots of places. Um, and uh, while the while California's um, geology, which, which makes for lots of disturbed ground, landslides, slumps, et cetera, favors non-natives, um, the bunch grasses are still there. And in, in uh, lots of places, they are getting more common uh, and showing up in, in greater that's volume. That's yeah. great. So you can always... Get the optimistic view from Seth, and that's good. That's that's good um, to hear. Somebody asked a follow-up question: Doesn't adaptation take over and allow the non-natives to survive? The non-natives, the non-natives developed in places where the grazing pressure, like the Middle East and Turkey, etc., where the grazing pressure was intense for thousands of years. So they're pretty damn tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, California natives evolved in the location. Um, and uh, um, uh, I used to think that endangered species or rare species were fragile. Um, and I, I've turned around my point of view completely, especially looking at things after fires, et cetera. I think the fact that they've held on despite all the different impacts um, shows that a lot of these endangered species are incredibly tough. Um, and uh, uh, in the time of climate change, we are all gonna have to do more to help with that adaptation collecting seed to, to uh, uh, manage populations um, as they move around and, and in order to keep them from going extinct. Um, and it's, it's an exciting time where we're gonna have to learn a lot more about park management and, and stewardship. People forget that the first big park uh, in the United States, which is a quintessential American idea, happened at the time of the Civil War and park management is just as young. Um, and we are going to become incredible experts uh, at, at park and land management over the coming hundreds of years. Yeah. Okay, um, I have another question for you, Seth. Um, why is Mount Diablo sustaining Diablo range um, especially important in this time of the climate crisis and mass species extinction events? Uh, I think I think I'd actually like like Joan or Ted Clement to to take on that idea, but if they really defer to me, I'll take it. Joan or Ted. I defer. <laughs> well, um, part of part of the answer to that is that in this time of the climate crisis and mass species extinction event, the resiliency of our natural systems is incredibly important. And uh, Mount Diablo is part of a greater whole. It is part of the Diablo range. It is sustained by the Diablo range. And this incredible natural system uh, needs to um, uh, be protected very carefully so that we help it remain resilient and better able to deal with the stresses of the climate crisis. Um, and um, that's one of the reasons, of course, that Save Mount Diablo has recently expanded our geographic area of focus further south in the Diablo range to help ensure that Mount Diablo is not cut off from its sustaining Diablo range and that the system remains more intact and, and more resilient to deal with all these immense stresses. And uh, we're just so grateful uh, for all that people are doing to support us uh, at this critical time so that we can keep this system intact and uh, resilient. This is one of my favorite topics, and Scott Hine is an incredible naturalist, so I'd be curious about, um, about his take uh, on, on this as well. Why is, why is the Diablo Range important as a wildlife corridor in the time of climate change? Well, you think about all the, the stresses that are putting, being putting out, put on the ecosystems as a result of, of climate change, drought, uh, wildfire. Um, 
you can uh, you know, destroy habitat in a certain place, but as long as there's connecting habitat that allow the species to you know, move, migrate, um, repopulate those areas, then um, you'll be able to sustain those, those uh, species over time. But if, if uh, Mount Diablo gets turned into an island because of, say, significant development that cuts it off from, from the rest of the Diablo range, other than you know, birds which can fly, um, you know, it's, it's difficult for plants and uh, terrestrial animals to, to move away. And then you have a island that's uh, um, going to slowly degrade in, in the quality of the um, habitat as, as more of these big climate change induced events happen. And partly it's the, the phrase that Joan has used a number of times in her audible guides, which I love, which is both we and, and uh, plants and animals need room to roam. Um, so on one, on, on one level, we just need as much land as we can protect that's connected. Um, and the Diablo range is obviously 150 to 175 miles long versus Mount Diablo, which is about 10 miles wide. Um, and uh, so, so having enough land um, and then the fact that the Diablo Range is north-south um, uh, oriented so that things can move from, from one climate area to another, the, the incredible diversity of topography, um, the ruggedness, the different aspects, um, the, the wetter areas on the west, the drier areas on the east, all of that gives an incredible diversity of habitat, which is one of the reasons the biodiversity is so high in the first place, but also allows for adaptation for things to move around um, as they're, they're dealing with various kinds of stresses. So um, we have to protect as much land as possible. And you, you may have heard of the governor's uh, and the, the president's um, uh, goal of protecting 30% of California and the country by 2030. Um, and a lot of people know we need to move not just to 30 by 30, but 50 by 50. Um, we need to protect enough land to help in this time of incredible environmental stresses um, to, to preserve our ecosystem services to, and to preserve the wildlife and plants uh, that are here and that are going to be, be stressed by the changes that are coming. Okay, I have a question for the panelists, specifically Joan, but I'd be fun to hear from Ken and Kendall, um, Steve and Scott as well. Um, what, what's your most memorable experience on the mountain? It might be a tough one, but I do like those kind of mm. questions. I've had a lot of them, but um, one that stands out was um, after the Morgan fire in 2013, I went out to um, Perkins Canyon, which I was working on at the time, and just saw a devastated landscape. I was crushed. I thought, I thought that uh, part of my mountain was gone forever. And then I came back that spring, and I looked across the same slope, and I saw masses and masses of lupin and poppies just spread all over everywhere. Not to mention the toy on the bays, the, uh, the, um, the chemise, all the shrubs were coming back. There were little sprouts of pine trees coming back. It, it was just so joyous that I'll remember it forever. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'll jump in, I'll say that, uh, that my most memorable experience changes as time goes on. Um, but most recently, uh, many of you know, I lost my mother, who was my best friend and everything to me and my biggest supporter. And, um, and so as a tribute to her, uh, her remains are scattered on Madrone Trail. And uh, our family had a, a service there for her. And so it makes the mountain so memorable to me. And I talked to so many people on Mount Diablo uh, who have been married on Mount Diablo, who celebrate their anniversaries, birthdays, who also have plans to have their remains scattered there. Um, so it goes back to that, the importance of this mountain to so many for so many thousands of years. Ken, do you have one? Oh, I don't think I have a, a particular really strong memory. I'm still hoping to see a mountain lion. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can make that happen for the next time we have a, um, I keep, another. I keep wishing, trying to wish bobcats into mountain lions, but it doesn't quite work. Mm -mm. But just about you know, every time you go out, you can expect to see something new and mm -hmm. every day on the mountain is special. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
How about Scott? Yeah, Scott would be interesting. Well, I'm a little bit like Ken. Um, you know, every time I go out, I just see something new and, and exciting and wonderful. Um, I think one of my most memorable uh, occasions on the mountain was was oh, it's probably been five or six years ago when we actually had big winter snows um, on the mountain, and I had actually predicted that there was going to be significant snow at the summit, and the the summit road was closed at junction, so I had to park there and hike up to the summit. And as I got toward the top, I caught up with a, a fellow on cross-country skis who was skiing up to the top. And then you get up to the top and there's uh, four or five inches of snow and all the trees are covered in, in snow. It's a, it's a Tahoe-like winter wonderland on top of Mount Diablo. But then you look down to the lower elevations and this was in February, I think. And so the hills had started to green up. Mm -hmm. And so you, you look at this juxtaposition of snow at the summit, looking down to the green hills down below. Um, that's a really memorable uh, experience for me. What do you think, Kendall? Kendall, I know you have some really special photography and video moments. And, and I, I would echo Ken's sentiment as well. Um, I, I can't think of, of one, uh, most memorable moment because there there are hundreds and 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 more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I picked up photography because every time I went, there was something amazing to to see. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, it ranges from from bobcats and and larger critters down to velvet ants mm -hmm. and and everything in between. Peregrine falcons, just just so much cool stuff to see out there. And and then the landscapes and and the amazing summit, the visitor center that that is on the mountain. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just uh, every, every trip is a memorable trip to me. And that, that's why I picked up the camera to keep it, keep it in, my, in my memory. You feel the same way, Seth? I, you might have some special memories. Um, I have a million magical moments and uh, some of the most incredible, I call ecstatic moments of serendipity where everything comes together mm -hmm. and you have this incredible experience. Um, and uh, they're not just, they don't usually just happen in a moment. They're, there's something that lasts an hour or something yeah. like that. And uh, the, the universe is just in balance and it's showing off for you. Uh, um, so I have, a, I have a bunch that, that I could talk about for a long time. Um, a lot of the other ones that I really like too are um, when you get to know the mountain as intimately as some of us have, pretty much everyone on, on the panel here, um, it becomes an old friend, you know where things are. You can take people out and you can literally pull things out of your hat over and over and over as you walk around. You know, Steve or, or Ken can take somebody out and know pretty, pretty much for certain they're gonna be able to show them tarantulas or, or whatever. Mary Bowerman was like that too. She knew the mountain plant by plant, location by location. Um, and that's a level of sense of place which uh, just, just roots you in an area and for me, it's like becoming an Indian, becoming a Native American, knowing the place so intimately that it's just part of you. Um, so, We had a couple questions about reintroducing species in the Diablo range, such as tule elk. And there was also another one asking about what, what happened to the trout and could they reintroduce trout? Tule elk have already been reintroduced to the Diablo range. In fact, I just got a call from, because people are seeing them down by Livermore. Um, and uh, um, uh, we don't have them on Mount Diablo just at the moment, but I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think that they're not going to be there at some point. Um, the rainbow trout were once found in Mitchell Creek and some of the other creeks, and um, the changes in hydrology made it difficult for them to survive, but I wouldn't count them out either. There's, when uh, Marsh Creek Reservoir um, gets replaced, there's going to be fish ladders there that are going to allow trout to come much higher up onto the slopes of Mount Diablo. Um, and the other one, which we reported on at a, another recent Nature Hills um, lecture, is a few weeks ago, for the first time in over 100 years, the first California condor that anybody has, has uh, um, tracked or recorded came back to the east side of Mount Diablo and hung out for an afternoon in Morgan Territory in Round Valley. And some of us have been waiting for that our entire lives. <laughs> so um, there are a lot of challenges um, that we're facing uh, ahead of us. Um, and there's a lot of great news as well. <laughs> um, 
So California condors coming back, back to Mount Diablo, I think of all the regional parks around Mount Diablo, Morgan Territory, et cetera, as part of Mount Diablo, just not part of Mount Diablo State Park. But that's an amazing thing, and you'll hear about it in one of our e-blasts um, later this week, maybe tomorrow, um, or uh, early next week. So California condors are back. <laughs> Um, we had, is anyone talking to indigenous people about their stewardship practices to apply to the park? There was also another question about, you know, renaming Mount Diablo State Park to its original uh, Native American name. And I know that we've spoken about that before, if anyone wants to comment on that. I'll just jump in by saying, uh, you know, I don't presume to speak on behalf of the state parks, but um, having attended many conferences and in, in talking with uh, other organizations uh, who are cooperative associations, uh, state parks is really making a, a concerted effort to introduce when when a park representative introduces themselves, they also introduce the land uh, uh, from who it was originally uh, inhabited. So um, you might have uh, Mount Diablo State Park would be a Bay Miwok or Ohlone lands, and so uh, State Parks is trying to to do more of that. Um, Joan is actually currently working on a brand new video on Native Americans and uh, Mount Diablo, and uh, maybe she could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we've been working with Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino, who are both Ohlone's, and they're not speaking for the Indian community as a whole. They're speaking for themselves, but they're very knowledgeable about Mount Diablo plants and Mount Diablo history. And they do talk about the Native American burning practices in the area, um, which is not just, I don't know uh, whether those practices are being adopted by land managers in the area, but we are um, Audible Mount Diablo and the organizations we work with are, are trying to get more in touch with native people and, and um, invite them to share their knowledge. And Karen, I think I'll just jump in here for a minute. At Save Mount Diablo, we um, really believe that diversification is going to be a critical part of the strategy to dealing with these historic uh, environmental challenges that we face, like the climate crisis or mass species extinction event. We need to connect with more types of people, invite more types of people into our land conservation tent, our land conservation team to learn from them, grow with them, uh, do great things together. And so tangible examples of that, uh, we have added a wonderful Native American man to our board of directors, Robert Phelps, who's also the director of the CSU East Bay Concord campus. Uh, we hired a wonderful uh, Native American man, uh, Sean Burke, as our land programs director. We've added bilingual hikes to our free Discover Diablo outings program. We've started to reach out to different types of outdoor user groups uh, by including mountain bike uh, outings in our Discover Diablo series, rock climbing experiences, hiking experiences, meditation and nature experiences. Um, <clears throat> we have got to learn to be together, um, uh, put differences aside um, and come together to face these historic challenges. And again, at Save Mount Diablo, it's embedded in our strategic plan. It's embedded in our climate action plan. The diversity is gonna be one of the most important ways that we come together at this critical time to address historic uh, environmental problems. And uh, we're very encouraged by it. And we're seeing great things as we reach out to more types of people. One, one last thing I would say about the name, um, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this uh, and responding to these kinds of suggestions, um, is Mount Diablo has many names, and that's perfectly fine. Um, Mount Diablo is, is one historic name that has some historical precedent um, uh, and is partly Spanish, partly English, um, but Tushtak or uh, the various other names, including additional names and additional um, uh, indigenous terms and interpretive um, materials and signs and things like that is perfectly appropriate. I was just traveling through some Indian reservations in some Western states a few weeks ago and it kept, it, 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 it reminded me of French, uh, of British, excuse me, um, of Quebec and being in, in Canada and seeing all the bilingual signs, but there were, there were lots of Indian language interpretations um, right alongside English. Um, so 
Don Diablo has many names. Um, I have one more question here. Uh, the current drought is severe and caused the springs to dry up in a water shortage in the park. Have you ever observed a similar drying of springs in the past, or is this the worst you've ever seen? Where do large mammals like mountain lions go for water? Ken. Poor Ken. <laughs> Figured if I'd wait long enough, you'd answer it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, there was a drought in the mid 70s. I was living here at the time, which was pretty severe. I know the uh, all the newt ponds and Brioni's had dried up. Um, where the mammals go for water. That's a good question. Um, I don't know how far up Mitchell can Mitchell Creek is dry. You, uh, it, there may be some puddles higher up on the mountain. They've got their places. And, and of course, there's the campgrounds. They're, they're, uh, some of the, the animals are expert at that, but the, this is pretty severe. The, the, uh, most of the cattle ponds, of course, in spring. So we'll see what, what the long-term impacts are. Most of the, the animals can stand a year or two, but if this goes on, then we'll probably see some pretty severe changes. You, okay. you give us a little bit more optimistic view, Seth? <laughs> Uh, animal populations change over time, and this is one of the stresses that, that they deal with it. But um, uh, prey populations, whether oaks or, or quail, have mast years where they have huge numbers of offspring. Um, and the, the lower years cut down the numbers of predators, and then the cycle continues. Um, I know one rancher who has nine ponds, and one of them has water in it right now. So a lot of the ranchers who are are very good stewards of land around Mount Diablo as well, are being stressed incredibly uh, right now too. Um, and um, a, a friend was just showing me pictures of the wildlife that are showing up in his backyard uh, because there's a lot of water and a lot of green grass down around the, the residential areas. And so um, the big things can take advantage of that. A lot of things are used to the dry times and estivate and, and uh, go underground. Um, but yeah, the longer a drought goes on, the more severely it's going to affect um, everything. Uh, Stacy's pointing out in the chat that um, that cattle troughs are, are a big help. And uh, if you want to see deer, the area along, along Angel Curley and, and Burma Road, um, there's a number of, um, of cisterns there that were intended for cattle, and they're, they're still full. Um, cruising down Northgate uh, a few weeks ago, um, I noticed there were five woodpeckers um, drinking from, from a seep that's right along the roadside. Um, and I think, I want to say Frog Pond also has, has a seep that is currently mostly mud. But there are, there are seeps that are distributed uh, along the mountain. And um, anything that can travel can, can make it to those, um, to those cattle troughs or the cisterns as well. So there's, there's still a little bit of water up there. Um, some of the creeks still have a few, a few pools mm -hmm. as well. One of our adaptations is we're going to have to help wildlife. We're going to have to provide water in more locations um, to deal with these kinds of these kinds of issues and make water troughs friendly for wildlife so they don't drown in them. Um, and that's on on our various properties. We're already starting to do that. Great. Well, that answers a lot of the questions here. So. I want to thank everyone, especially the panelists and Joan Hamilton for making such an amazing video and everyone for contributing. Um, uh, several people have asked, um, yes, this presentation will be available. We'll send out a link uh, to the presentation to everyone who's registered and it'll also be on our YouTube Nature Heals and Inspires playlist. So that's available anytime you wanna watch it again. And um, we just thank you enough, uh, so much for joining us for all the people at MDIA on behalf of Save Mount Diablo. Um, we really appreciate um, your support and your interest in this amazing anniversary of the park. Thank you very much. Thanks thank everybody, you, come see us Saturday. Thank you. thank you, Joan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joan.